Hello, my name is Lauren Simmons, and I am sending you love from a distance. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us again on Love From A Distance. So we started off today's live recording with that empowering profile of today's guest, Lauren Simmons, because in the midst of all the chaos that is before us, we must remember to still hope, dream, and envision empowering possibilities. Now, I know that many of us are still worried about what the loss of Justice Ginsburg means for the future of America. And there are many of us who are indignant about the miscarriage of justice surrounding the murder of Breonna Taylor. But in the midst of this year of endless challenges and disappointments, we must keep our eyes on the prize of change we must exercise resilience and dare the audacity of hope. That is how we can love ourselves and one another. So let's love by being courageous, by continuing to dream, and by standing for the things we believe in and by voting. And that's a perfect segue to saying hello to the woman who has taught us so much about love, courage, and hope over the years, my sister friend, Iyanla Vincent. Hello, Diba, Diba, Mistina, how are you? I am so very well, Iyanla, how are you? I am so good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm excited, I'm, you know, I'm excited. I'm, I'm what excited. has you excited? That the taxes have been released. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I actually, the occupants, on. The occupants taxes have been released. <laughs> yeah, that's, baby. That's, that's news to me. When yeah, did that happen? happen? Well, the New York Times got a copy of them. And they're saying that in 2016, the year the occupant went into the White House built by Black people, yeah. that um, he only paid $750 in taxes. $750 in taxes. Now, wow. I'll pay 45 times that much. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Now, does he, oh, oh there's just so much to dig into. I'm wiping in the corners of my mouth. Yes, yes, I hear you. Because I want to know, you know, uh, are the Russian connections there in his tax returns? I want to know, is he as wealthy as he claims to be? I want to, yeah, I, I bet you. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. And this is what I want everybody to get. This is just, that's just, I don't even know what you call it. Here's the thing that we need to understand. They have stacked the courts. You know, the Supreme Court yeah. is one thing. And I kept, I had to really pray about it and ask, you know, why is nobody calling this boy on his stuff. Why? Because they have benefited and will continue to benefit from the fact that the courts are stacked, the appellate courts. You know, so when you, you have a, a, a trial and something happens in business or in, in whatever, estates, in land taxes or whatever, you know, the appellate court is stacked. So if you want to appeal, it's going up the ladder and, you know, it's meeting with all of this. And that's what they're trying to do with the Ginsburg seat. So I don't yeah. know. Um, I don't know what's going to well, happen. But you know, and, and when you bring that up, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the long view that Republicans have historically taken. You know, because that kind of stacking uh, was being 
put in place before Trump. Yes. And yeah. it is just so important for us in our in our everyday lives and in our society to be aware of how important it is to have an intention and then to start stacking your life for yeah. your intention because people are making moves about your life That's and right. if you're not paying attention yeah then you're just going to wind up living the life that they hand you well this is what i know i don't know about nobody else i work for god incorporated <laughs> absolutely and they may mean it for evil but god means it for good and so I want to encourage everybody to get in right relationship with your creator and you'll be able to walk between the raindrops. That's what I'm going for. I'm trying to learn how to walk between the raindrops. Yeah. They can pour yeah. down rain and I'm going to be, I ain't yeah. even going to get wet. Yeah. They may mean it for evil, but God means it for good. But I tell you to watch it unfold. <laughs> I find it quite amusing. Yeah. You know, yeah. my, my only concern is, um, you know, the people who are hungry. They, you know, that breaks my heart. Well, that's a big concern because there are a lot of hungry people out there. The number of people who are the, hungry. The, the, the number, number of people, people who are, who are under the... Evicted, uh, yeah. You know, and I, I just, I don't, I don't know what to do anymore. I've given to every food bank, every, you know, I, I can't move the people in with me. Uh, so this voting thing... You know, and then not only do we need to vote, um, hopefully to change the guard, but then we've got to have a clear ask and, and stay on the people who get in if this guard is changed. We got, you know, we can't just vote and then run away. We got to have a clear ask. I, I, I tell you, I have written so many letters. They're going to put me on the, I don't even know what the list is. This, here come this crazy woman again. I have written everybody. I've written Republicans, Democrats, Independents, the green people. Listen, <laughs> but we have to stay on them because we think it's just about voting. Voting is one thing, but then it's about stay on them, stay on them, stay on. How many people wrote letters about this Breonna Taylor thing? How many people have written letters to their representatives saying, don't let them have the seat? What we got to do? I even thought the other day, I said, I'm going to put a petition online and let people in every state sign up. But you know why I didn't do it? Because people are so mean and so crazy. I don't, I want to be able to walk out my front door, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, so I don't, I don't want You, you know, a, a thought that did cross my mind, Iyana, um, uh, that I'll throw out here. I have no idea how to make this happen, but I swear it would be so good. And all of you love ambassadors out there, listen up. If we put 30 days of prayer on our calendar, so Psalm that 39, Psalm, you, Psalm 37, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious of workers of iniquity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Psalm 37. I love you. Get in it. I just Get love in you. It. Get in Psalm 37 yes. and then yes. call their yes. names. Every line yes. you read, call another name. Call another name. Yes. Get in Psalm 31. Psalm 31. He who abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? Get in yes. there. And yes. you know, because we don't understand the power of our minds. If we would just send That's that right. energy out, That's right. we would That's stop right. breaking up these particles of darkness. That's exactly anyway, right. Let me That's take exactly it. right. We need That's to put exactly that. right. We need y'all mm -hmm. pray 30 days. Get in Psalm 31. Yeah, Get you know, with, reach out, to reach out and create a prayer circle with people yeah. that you know and in your family or friends. Prayer works, yeah. you know. Let me call um, attendance here. Go ahead. Go ahead. We, gonna have, we got a guess and we having our own show. <laughs> Hi, Atlanta. Hi, Alabama, Cincinnati. How you doing, Brooklyn, Jamaica, St. Croix, Sacramento, Harlem's in the house. Yeah. LA is in the house. Miami, Mississippi, Kansas City, the boogie down Bronx. Come on, y'all praying up in the Bronx. Philly's in the house. Ellenwood, Georgia's in the house. Albany, New York is here. Hola, como esta? 
Reverend Rosetta, how you doing? All my spiritual warriors, deep bow to you, States, Borough, Ohio, Akron, Ohio. Oh, Ohio's in the house. Brooklyn, the BK, NOLA's in the house. Lorton, Virginia. I used to go to the prison in Lorton and do groups with the men. I think they closed the men's side down. San Francisco, Charlotte is in the house. St. Louis is in the house. Memphis is in the house. Delaware's in the house. What's that? Corona. Coram. I don't know no Coram, New York. But anyway, they in the house. Swit on a number tribe. Come on, somebody. Alabama, Flatbush. Flatbush. I wish I could go. You know what? Let me tell you something. This is so funny. The other day, I, you know, I'm not home. I'm, we're working on the show. And I kept having these flashbacks, like of driving to my house and the market I shop in. And, and then I saw like trees and stuff. I said, oh God, am I getting ready to die? What's happening? I'm having all these flashbacks. <laughs> Why am I? And then I would smell the grass and I said, okay, if I'm getting ready to die, my soul is right. And then I heard in my head, no fool, you just homesick. <laughs> <laughs> Because you, you're in Atlanta still working, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. I said, oh, okay. I, <laughs> you were, just you were missing the smells of your, uh, yeah, you were missing the smells of your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. So say hi to Flint, Michigan, and Compassion Tribe, cohort number four, Baton Rouge. Yeah, bed -Stuy. do or die, bed -Stuy. Come on, I'm coming over to Fulton Street and get me a roti. Yes, so we got the gang is all here. We got a nice That's number beautiful. for our beautiful guest tonight. Yes. Hi, Shirley from Detroit. How you doing? <laughs> well, it is wonderful to have you all show up. And you, you met her just a little bit in our pre-roll to the show. But um, at 22 years old, Lauren Simmons shattered the glass ceiling and made history by being the youngest and only full-time female equity trader on Wall Street for Rosenblatt Securities. Affectionately called the Wolfette of Wall Street, Simmons was also the second African-American woman in history to hold the prestigious title. Since her story broke, uh, Lauren has been featured in various media outlets, including Harper's Bazaar, Yahoo Finance, Forbes, Politico, CNBC, and The Cut. Currently, Lauren is executive producing her own biopic at AGC Studios with Kiersey Clemens, attached to Star. What an exciting time to be a young woman, right, Iyanla? Oh, I Let's can't take it. <laughs> so true. Let's welcome Lauren. Lauren, hello. Yeah, hello. hello. From a yeah. I'm there. so happy to be here. Oh, <laughs> it's so nice to have you. Yes, thank you. I thank tell you. you. You do us proud, my beloved. You do mm -hmm. us proud. You Thank do us you proud. Thank you so much. I was, telling them, I was telling you before the show, I said, uh, only thing I know about the stocks is that they go up and down and I lost my money. <laughs> 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 I lost my money. <laughs> and I said, yeah. who is responsible for this? <laughs> and, and, and everyone said, you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You so are. To, what an incredible journey. Now, how long have you been on the floor? When did you sign the book? I signed the book in 2017. I had passed the series 19 in March, but we had an official ceremony uh, December of that year. My whole family from Georgia came up. My family from Brooklyn came in. Um, and, you know, I signed the book with the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts. Like, I signed my name into history. I, I was... It's the most incredible experience I've ever had. Now, let me ask you this, Lauren. In the morning, we saw in your tape, and I've seen, you know, we've seen it everywhere. In the morning, before it opens, everybody's screaming. What are they screaming about? <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to get the, uh, the, the quotes on the, the stocks and what's going on. So it, whatever, the, whatever the opening stock price of Apple, they're trying to get that. And that's what they're calling out. Who, who but are they trying to get it? What do you mean they're trying to get it? They're trying they're to buy? A, a, they're trying. A calling, they're calling out a number to be able to tell the people inside the booth who are on the phone with our clients. We're on the phone in real time with people in the morning. So we're letting them know what is going on, how certain stocks are going to open. So if Apple, and I'm just throwing out a number, if ABC stock is $19.85, 
we're saying ABC stock is $19.85 and we're yelling that out so we can be on the phone with the client, the people in the booth, so they could, you know, be able to relay that information to them. And then they say, we want to buy, we want to sell, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds wow. like a lot of yelling that's unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what, is it, what is it that you love about that? Because you have to love it. First of all, being the only fly in the soup bowl. <laughs> now, you're, you're, you're not still on the floor, are you? No, no, no. I left okay, about so a year ago. But, I, but I, what I loved about it, I mean, for me, it was my first job out of college. So I just was so like eager and hungry to learn any and everything that I could to be good within that role. For me, no, I obviously didn't seek out finding the New York Stock Exchange or entering the world in finance, but whatever job that I was going to go into after I graduated college, I just wanted to be really good at it. So I wanted to learn every and anything that I could about the role and, and be successful within that role. Yeah. Wow. So what do you do now? What do you do now? You're not on necessarily on the floor now. What do you do? I, I do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I, wow. I, it's like hard because when people say, what do you do? I'm like, should I go down the laundry list? I mean, I am a multifaceted entrepreneur. I, I do it all. I'm a film producer. I'm creating my own TV series. I'm a host of a TV series writing a personal finance book, contributor to uh, CNBC, Yahoo Finance. Um, so I, I do many That's where things. I saw you. I saw you on CNBC. I was like, oh, look at the little puppy. Look at her. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so um, you, you actually have a perspective uh, that I find interesting. You, um, in your in your interview, your pre-interview, it talked about you coming from genetics, that you studied genetics in school, mm -hmm. and yet genetics was not really um, a path for you once you were out of school. And you were talking about how important it is to be flexible and not live a linear life. Tell us, tell us more about that. Okay, um, I'm trying to think, where do I start? So yeah, genetics, I chose genetics. I have a brother with cerebral palsy. And for me, I wanted to pretty much impact families the way that doctors had impacted mine growing up. And so I wanted to go on and get my PhD in genetic counseling, which for anyone who doesn't know who, what that is, essentially where I thought we were in technology, but what they are able to do is we can test both parents to see if a child, their offspring will have any genetic abnormalities. Um, so we would be able to tell people like, hey, like your child might have Down syndrome. And where I thought we were in technology is we were able to alter DNA so that someone wouldn't be able to live with those genetic abnormalities. Because I know how hard it is to grow up with a family member uh, with disabilities. Turns out altering DNA is illegal, which now <laughs> I'm thinking that might be appropriate, but <laughs> I, I always think that intentions are good. It's people who make them bad. But um, nonetheless, I end up moving from Georgia to New York and I said I would figure it out. Um, I did because I studied genetics and I had a minor in statistics. I had a lot of um, math involved. What that actually correlated to look like as far as my career, I had no idea. I kind of was winging it like any other 21 year old coming out of college. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, my just kind of backtracking a little bit, my sophomore year in college, I started meditating. I started meditating. I started journaling. Um, I really followed this practice of, you know, your mind creates your reality mm -hmm. and really putting that into focus after I graduated college. And one of, you know, the most helpful books for me at that time was The Universe Has Your Back by Gabby Bernstein. Um, and, you know, it really is true. Your mind creates reality. Like, it is absolutely phenomenal. And what we can manifest if we just focus that energy. Yeah. And um, so when people say, what did that look like? I don't know. I was open to receiving from the universe. I was open to receiving whatever path was meant for me would be for me. And I knew that the right people would be put in my place to help me achieve that. 
And that's kind of how I made the connection at the New York Stock Exchange. You know, one of the conversations that I had with Rich Rosenblatt, you know, just so awed by me because there are people like, you didn't study finance, you had no background, no knowledge, and yet you still applied for that position. And while my journey to New York, I had interviewed with a lot of people, I connected with a lot of people, and a lot of people would say, I'm too ambitious, I didn't have any clarity as to what I want to do. Richard Rosenblatt chose me for all those reasons. For all mm. those reasons that people thought were negative, mm. he saw the positive in that. He said, this woman had the audacity to come from Georgia, mm -hmm. a woman from the South mm -hmm. with no finance background and apply for a position that she knew nothing about. And, and, and maybe I didn't know that I was gonna be the only woman, but I knew that I was going to be in a room full of men and that still didn't stop me from applying for that position. He's like, yes, sold. Yes, you have the job. <laughs> um, and that is how I ended up at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, well, now you actually, um, you passed, what is this that you the passed? The, what the is series it called? 19, series 19. Okay. Okay, so let's be very clear. She passes the series 19, and you'll tell us what that is, where the mm -hmm. pass rate is only 20%. Mm -hmm. I so want to hear this story because mm -hmm. um, you didn't have a background in finance. Did you study for the series 19? Tell us about this story. Of course, yeah. So the series 19 is interesting because um, it's a floor broker New York Stock Exchange in-house exam. So prior to the ex to the New York Stock Exchange being public, it was private. And when it was private, the exam was an exam, but essentially, I mean, it's no secret nepotism is at its finest at the New York Stock Exchange, but they would take this test, but they really wouldn't take it. They would kind of just give the test administrator a pack of beer or the test administrator would allow them to self grade at their tests and they would pass. Um, once the New York Stock Exchange became public and the test was now administered under FINRA, FINRA is the uh, financial regulatory system all over all financial exams to be a representative in finance. Um, it was a legitimized exam. No one could cheat their way into it. And the exam, you know, was hard, like 100%. And it was something I had to pass. There were other people in my class who came on the trading floor with me and, and were, you know, around the same, we were all coming out of college, so we were around the same age. Um, and one in particular, I truly respect him. I do, I do. Um, and, you know, his father, is an interesting man, but I do respect his father nonetheless. But in any FINRA exam, anybody who's out there having to take a financial exam, you have three times to take the exam. Once you fail it the third time, you either have to wait six months to a year before you can take it again. This gentleman took it three times and his father, being who his father is at the New York Stock Exchange, made a stink, a stink about the exam, being biased, not being a, a good exam, these questions aren't real questions, whatever. And they were able to magically find points for him to pass this <laughs> exam. It's like the bar exam. <laughs> Essentially, yes. And, and, and then also coming in on to the trading floor, there was another lady who worked upstairs. So we have upstairs and downstairs, and the downstairs is the people that work at the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, she had been in finance for over 40 years. She had every FINRA license you could think of. So she she was great at her job. My first week coming into the New York Stock Exchange, she takes the exam and she fails. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this lady has every exam out there. If she fails, you know, what am I going to do? But I'm a type of person, the power of positive thinking is everything, right? So I'm not going to look at, okay, how did she fail? How did she get to this point? I'm going to look at, okay, there is a 20% pass rate. Let me put my energy into that and let me focus on that. And I passed. And, and I, I just stress this because there are people who are out there that say, oh, you know, equity trading is such an easy position and so, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, all that may be the case. And we are definitely at a point in technology where um, a lot of the trading we do is passive and we can just put it into a machine and it does all the numbers and everything. But passing that test is 
a pass or a fail, and that is on the person taking the exam. No one outside of the individual who's dead, you know, whatever. Um, you don't you don't get a freebie to get on the floor. You do have to earn your spot on the trading floor, and I earned mine. All right. Well, now wait a minute. That's right. right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But I have to I have to read this because uh, as informative as that was, this is pretty exciting. Um, it says these are your words. I'm told. Everyone thought I was going to fail. When I found out I passed, I didn't scream. I didn't get excited. I just opened the result pa results paper and closed it. And everyone was like, did you pass? And I was like, I did. And, and there was silence on the trading floor and you could only hear the machines whirling. Everyone mm -hmm. was in shock and I rang mm -hmm. the bell that day. <laughs> That's how you do that. That's how you do that. That's how, exactly. Exactly. So please walk us through what was happening. If that's accurate, right? Then yeah. what was happening in your mind when you read that you passed? What, I mean, did you expect that you were going to pass? I know you've just been talking about the power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. And what was behind such a i won't calculated. call it reserved. calculated you well, not you the response was, calculated. Was, was the response calculated was your response calculated i think it was a, honestly if i'm being perfectly honest i think it was a mixture of emotions i know when i opened the paper and i saw that I passed, and i didn't even care what the number was it was a pass and i was like i'm gonna call my mom like i just want to <laughs> call my mom but did I go into the exam thinking I was going to fail? I think for the most part, people know, I think, I think about 80% of the time people know if they're going to pass or fail, right? Like if you fully put in the work to study, then you, you know, you're going to pass. So for me, I'm not the loud person who, you know, will say, oh yeah, I'm going to pass. Like, I just rather you see it. I don't need to talk. Silence is way more powerful. And prior to taking that exam, yeah, the men on the floor were openly taking bets that I was going to fail. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's a 20% pass rate, like a majority of people do fail. And so I don't think there was an expectation that I was going to pass. And especially being a woman, because there just aren't there many women on the trading floor. When I was on the floor in 2017, I was the only woman. But it was also this thing of, I don't know, you know, the men on the floor just kind of reducing it down to it's no way that she can be an attractive woman to pass this exam. Like well, only an attractive black woman. How about that? At, at mm -hmm. that as well, right? So um, <laughs> when I passed, yeah, I opened it and the men on, it's 250 men on the floor. Things get passed around very quickly. I think once they saw my face, once I opened it, because everybody was watching me, right? And I didn't look sad. And then someone flat out was like, okay, so did you pass? And I was like, yes, it, it did shock everybody. It did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. But it was, it was a proud moment and it was a moment not for anyone else. It was a moment that I just really wanted to call my mom and say, I did it, I passed. Like, <laughs> I'm an equity <laughs> trader. Um, and that, that's all for me. That was the only important thing for me. I have, I have another quote of yours that I, mm -hmm. I teach all the time, but I want you to speak to it because people have, well, anyway, you said, <laughs> I tell people, I tell people you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yep. The biggest growth comes from putting yourself in a new environment. Would you please talk to that? Because people of my generation, they eat the same grits, the same spoon, the same time, looking at the same program, they wear the same drawers, to the, you know, the same toilet paper. Please speak about the power I, you know, of being I think, I think people are comfortable being uncomfortable and like to go into Pandora, Pandora's box and what could you, what could be behind that is scary. Yeah. But I genuinely believe all the achievements I've ever made I have had that, that little internal fear, like, what is it? And it's, and it's good fear. Like, this isn't fear that we should be turning away from. It is the, it's the unknown is what's the scary part, but it doesn't have to be scary, especially 
if you are going back to this mindset, thinking that whatever is meant to be for me will be, and the, these results will end up positive, and even if they end up negative, because I hate I hate the, the association that's associated with the word negativity. Like all of this, good, bad, and different is all a learning lesson. And so yeah. would you rather live life always fearful, not taking risk, or would you rather take risk and just see what, what's out there? Because I, I think there's just so much world to be learned and so much of a person that you can grow into by just, you know, going outside of your comfort zone. So for me, yeah, there were a lot of people, you know, a lot of the, you know, most common questions I get, well, how did it feel being a woman or how did it feel to be, you know, one of the few black people to work on the floor? It, it didn't feel anything. And, and why? One, because I've been a black woman since the day I've been born. I didn't just wake up <laughs> the day before get I get black at the start. And it's like, whoa, I'm black. You know, like this is something that I've lived with. I lived with being a woman. I know what that feels like. That has nothing to do with being successful in my job. That has nothing to do with putting myself out there and going on and finding the next big thing. So for me, to get that question, I understand because a lot of that comes from people's comfort and not wanting to put themselves out there, but these are everyday things. This, this shouldn't even be like a priority or a focus or even like one of the things that should stop my momentum. I'm a black woman. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> you know, I tell my students all the time that if you're getting ready to do something, particularly something new, if you don't have a little pee running down your leg, then it ain't big enough. Whatever the newness needs to scare the pee out to you. And then if you don't learn anything else, you'll learn how to show up with pee on your leg and, and not be distracted by it. So, so many people, uh, once they feel the pee coming, they run. And I'm saying, no, that's good. No. The pee, you know, now you don't want to push. Puddle that's in a breakthrough. The yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> right. Get some of the pins and keep on moving. <laughs> Tell us about your movie. Tell us about your movie. So we've gone from college and genetics to the stock exchange. Now we're making movies. Somebody talk to me. Come on, girl. <laughs> yes. So um, I, at the time, while I was still on the floor, I had multiple studios reached out and um, while I was trying to figure out if I was going to do a TV series or a movie on my life, I had Kiersey Clemens reach out to me personally. Um, Kiersey Clemens and I, over the last two years, have actually developed a real relationship. I think we're very similar. Um, and she tell, is, tell the audience who she is, because I'm sure they do not know. Oh, well, Kiersey is the best, but she recently just came out with a movie with uh, Janelle Monet, Antebellum. Uh, she's also started Dope. We are the same age. She's just as charismatic, fearless, tough. I mean, we we definitely are pretty much the same people, honestly. Um, <laughs> but she reached, she reached out to me and she said, Lauren, I want to play you in a movie. Like she was first actress to come to me, said, I want to play you in a movie. I want to amplify your voice and to show people a positive Black story and, and a modern day historical figure. And, and what I are you, said, Gen Z? You're a Z, right? I have a what? Are, are you a Gen Z? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right at the cuff. So I'm like okay. one year older. So I'm okay. like the last, I'm like right on the edge. Okay. Um, and I'm like, uh, yes, you could play me. <laughs> um, absolutely. And once I chose her, I ended up choosing AGC because of Glendon Palmer. Glendon Palmer is absolutely phenomenal. He has been you know, a mentor to me has been a person who's really believed in my vision. He's been a soundboard. I can't have enough. I can't thank him enough for the things that he has done outside of this movie. He, you know, I, I won't get too much into it, but he has helped me find my new management team. He has helped me, you know, be able to say, I want a TV series for it to not sound crazy for him to say, yes, I want, I want AGC to do this TV series with you. And he, you know, he really believes in me and, and does it in such a nonchalant way. You know, it's just like, yeah, like I'm just here to help and wants nothing back. And I think when you have champions and people rallying behind you, it's phenomenal. I'm so grateful for even Richard Rosenblatt, who, who did the exact same thing, um, you know, just giving me an opportunity on the trading floor. And he's like, how can I help? Um, when you have people like that, who I say literally will move mountains to, to make anything happen, 
you feel so supported and you know that you're on the right path. And I know with, with Kiersey and Glendon, I'm, you know, I'm in great hands. Here's a question. Cause you walked away from the stock exchange, right? Yes. And mm-hmm. sometimes when people have a success of that magnitude, they mm-hmm. think that's it. Talk to yeah. me about the process of walking away, you know, cause I'm getting ready to walk away from a huge success in my life. And people are like, you're crazy. What the, and I'm like, Mm-mm. so talk as a youngin, talk to yeah. people about that, that moment when you say, I may not be finished, but I'm complete here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cause I think for me, whenever you get into a new role, um, you, at least for me, I want to be the dumbest person in the room. I want to learn all that I can. And then once I've done it and I've gotten to a place where I'm comfortable, okay, I need to go on and do something else that's going to light the fire in me, right? And so I knew probably six months before I was leaving the trading floor. I think I've always known that I was going to leave the trading floor, if I'm being quite frank. But I knew definitely six months before this is it. Um, And I had a conversation with Richard Rosenblatt. This was at the height of all these stories coming out and everybody wanted to talk about my journey, but I I knew it was it. And what I loved so much about Richard Rosenblatt was that he had open arms. He, He said, you know, well, what is it that you want to do next in your career? How can I help you? And at this time I was thinking I wanted to, thought I wanted to continue to stay in corporate America, which nothing is wrong in corporate America. Um, But I realized that, as I was having these conversations with him and trying to think of the next step, I realized I have a stronger voice and platform by doing something completely different than what was previously done. Yes, I can go on to another job at somewhere and make six plus figures, but like, what is the impact that I'm doing? How am I educating people? How am I bringing more awareness to bring others who look like me or who are women within the financial industry? And I said, I'm not going to be able to do that going to any other organization. I'm, that is going to be, a, that's going to be something Lauren is going to have to build out, which is how I made that decision. But there are plenty of people, oh, how did you leave the trading floor? If I'm being quite frank, I was only making $23,000 on the trading floor. So it was a very easy decision to say, okay, next step, next chapter in my life, because 23,000 in New York is only enough to breathe. Um, And I I just was ready to to do something else, honestly. And I'm so happy the men on the floor may have not gotten it, but Richard Rosenblatt always understood. And he said, yes, how can I do this with open arms? Who can I connect you with? How can we help build out your dream. And that is what I mean being surrounded and supported by people that will go and do everything to help you accomplish whatever your dreams are. Yeah, that's, that, that, is, that is just absolutely beautiful. And so did you know, it's, it sounds like you are building out some sort of financial um, system or program. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So again, I really wanted to empower the next generation to be financially well with overall financial wellness and finance isn't just finance is also the power of the mind as well. And, and being in a good place. And I read a lot of self-help books. Um, obviously I say Gabby Bernstein, but, uh, Wayne Dyer is one of my favorite Koya Webb. Um, Yala Van Zandt. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, but, Put you them know, on top of me. <laughs> and I, of course, when I um, was thinking about, um, you know, what was next, it, it was this mindset of like, how can I help educate and empower the next generation? Again, it wasn't just about the money. And I, and I tell people as great as it is to, to get money, and it is, that that's only going to be a motivating factor for so long. That's right. And then you're gonna want to do something that brings you passion. And I truly believe 90% of the time, whatever your passion is, the money will follow. That's Sometimes right. mm-hmm. the passion mm-hmm. that you have, the money won't follow, and that's okay, but you're so content and so happy with your passion that it doesn't even matter about the money. And for but me- It's purpose. It's passion yeah. plus purpose equal prosperity. So yes. you are on yes. purpose, and you had passion, and you were on purpose, and that's why the prosperity came. Yep. Sometimes people are on purpose, but they don't have a passion because they're preoccupied with trying to get the money or trying yep. to turn their purpose into prosperity. And your purpose ain't a job, it's a passion. 
Yeah. Correct. Yeah, Correct. Yeah. I was having actually a conversation with another panel about a, a, a week or so ago and, you know, just trying to get more African Americans in the financial industry. And I'm like, listen, I, I don't even, I'm not even a person who advocates for like, go out and find a job in finance, find a job in finance. If you feel like that is your passion and your purpose, but if it's not, I don't, don't just get a job in finance because you can make six figures. That that's not going to make you happy. I know many men in finance who make a lot of money and they are the unhappiest people in the world. <laughs> so do something that you love. If finance is something that you love, then yes, go and do it. But I, I tell people, yes, get your finances in order. Go in finance if you want to go in finance, but I want you to pursue things that make you happy, period. And so I, I you know, these conversations about diversity and inclusion and how we how do we get more people of color within the financial industry well one they they you know let them be curious because i was curious and i liked it but just because you're curious does not mean you're going to love it and that's not what's going to sustain you long term at all the, the other thing is you know particularly for us people of color we have a genetic memory and an ancestral mm -hmm. connection to money being a struggle. I mean, our ancestors worked for 400 yes. years for free. Yes. Yes. That thing has to be cleaned up. That's my work, yes. you know, so that wherever we are, that our money is not tied to what we do. Our money mm -hmm. is tied to how we think and how we be. And I think that that's what you're sharing with us that's so incredible. Your money will be tied to how you think and how you be and being happy, having joy, having peace is is um because i made more money at peace than i did when i had two jobs <laughs> yep, yep. yeah 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 so so i'm i'm curious um it sounds like you know you went into the stock exchange without any financial backing or financial background mm -hmm. and just being on the floor being in the environment of money going up and, and disappearing so quickly. Is that what gave you a passion for finance? And now you're turning that passion into a platform for teaching? Did, yes. did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. No, essentially it, it was learning about finance. Like if you're going to go into finance, I think working at the New York Stock Exchange and learning from the ground floor how the market moves, you learn so much. Would I suggest going to the New York Stock Exchange to work? not for 20,000, but <laughs> as a starting platform, I think you can learn so much. And for me, it, it fascinated me, but it also fascinated me that this isn't a, a kept secret. This is knowledge that the whole world can have access to, but they don't because only limited amount of people come to the New York Stock Exchange. And so I wanted to be able to be a resource and give accessibility to the world that is just unfamiliar with with everything that happens down there and that is kind of how i merged the two yes i had a passion i again could have probably gone and continued in corporate america but it, it was more about giving the people the knowledge and the resources to make them have better financial wellness overall lauren tell, tell us three things that every average person needs to know about the stock, stock exchange. Just an average person. I know you can lose money. I got that one, but no, don't start there. <laughs> okay. Three things, um, know. three things. Well, as far as investing in the market, if you have fear, fear that is not, that's you not your place to be. You know fear, period. Uh, two, you will not get rich overnight because some people seem to think that and that's just not the case. This is a place where you park your money, you leave it, you don't look at it for years. Um, and then three, it's um, being smart about investing. We have this, we have this, we have the whole world in the palm of our hands and people yes. are not utilizing the resources that are out there. I want you to make smart decisions. These smart decisions, all it takes is a quick Google to understand the stock, to learn the history of the stock, to learn the financials of the stock, and putting that all together to make sound decisions when investing in the market. You have everything that you need in the palm of your hands. I 100% guarantee you. And if you don't know, you have all the resources to get to a person that will have the answers for you. 
All right. That's exciting. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, uh, Lauren, this has actually been so wonderful. How, how can our viewers like follow you, uh, learn more about what you're up to in terms of how you're going to be revolutionizing finance and helping people to be more financially literate? Yeah, so you can always follow me on uh, Instagram at LA Simmons and also on LinkedIn. But I also have a new show coming out called Going Public. And I am so excited for this new TV series. Um, Going Public is essentially, we are following five companies that are being listed at the NASDAQ in real time. And you, everyday investors, not institutional clients, will be able to participate in the IPO. You will follow the journey of these five <sighs> founders. I will be mentoring them. You will be able to understand the financials, what goes into making an IPO an IPO, how they raise capital. And really it's to give you guys the power, the power to be able to invest in maybe a potentially a next Amazon, but also to be um, financially empowered and educated because I, that's all I truly want. If I can just reach one person to be educated when it comes to investing, I feel like I've done my job on this planet and I'm here to teach you. Please watch Going Public. It comes out what? spring 2021. What, what network do you know? It's coming out on entre, entrepreneurmedia.com. So it's okay. going to be on a streaming platform. Okay. So okay. everybody, that please go wonderful. watch, learn, educate, and empower yourselves. Listen, so what's the name of it question. again? Going, uh, going public. public. Here's yes. a quick question. Is there yes. a book you would recommend for a beginning stock investor? I get that question all the time. Um, a book. See, I didn't read any books. I, okay, I read well then don't, one book. Don't recommend okay. it. Okay. <laughs> you showed us the phone. Use your phone. That's your book. Yeah. Yeah. Google yeah. your yeah. world. Professor Google. That's my second husband. <laughs> <laughs> he gives me everything I need. <laughs> He handles it for me. Come on, Mr. Google. He does, he does. <laughs> He's second well, it, it, to Amazon. <laughs> it has been such a pleasure. Um, if, there, if there are any parting words, you just gave uh, on our audience some really valuable advice in terms of how much power they have in the palm of their hands. But if there's any parting advice that you want to share, um, we'll take it. And then we have to say goodbye. Of course. I do want to just read one quote because I want everybody to honestly know, like, everything is going to be okay. Yes. I know sometimes we have circumstances and it just doesn't seem like it, but the power of the mind is so strong. And I always look at the positivity. I was listening in on you guys before you guys invited me in. If you put your energy into the 30 days, making it positive you will see the positivity even if others don't. You can find the moments to be grateful for and to be positive about. But just one last quote. It okay. says, good morning. This is God. I will be handling all of your problems all of your today. today. Yes. I will not need your help. So have a miraculous day. And I want everybody <laughs> to listen to that. I love that quote so much. Don't worry about it. Whatever is going to happen will happen, but you will get through it. You will get through it. Join us in Psalm 37 yeah. and 91 for the next <laughs> three days, Laura. Yes, yeah. yes, yes of course. Thank, yeah. you, thank you, thank you, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It was such a pleasure, truly. Oh, don't you? I love the youngins. I just want to bite them on their cheeks. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, it, it is very exciting to, because I, I see life uh, a bit like a, a baton, you know, and we were handed this piece of, of, a, of a life to run with for however many years we're here. And life is on this journey to become what it has intended for itself. And we just have the honor to be here and to run our part of the race. And when I see the younger generation coming up, it is just, it is affirming that yeah. life knows how to take care of itself. 
Well, I'm just glad that they're not doing what what my generation did because we, you know, we did not pass the baton. We passed a lot of limitations and restrictions and foolish mint and wahala and conflomeration. <laughs> that's so where I'm that's glad. where they were. That's where and that's no. where evolution. But, but that was our know. job. Our job was to bring it forward and pass that's it right. on. But that's I am right. so glad that these uh, Zers, you know, yeah. the millennials, the Zers, you know, that they are. They're making a whole new way. I mean, you know, just for me to go to college, my family was like, oh, "How you gonna do that? You can't go do that. You go, what? Yeah, you, yeah. you better get you a good government job." And when I graduated, it was graduate high school, get a good city job, and die. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what, Iyana, I think that that is so important because it affirms that life is on a journey. And y'all, we need to pay attention and realize that, you know, if you are stuck in how you did things yesterday, yeah. life is going to pass you by and you will leave a lot of life on the table. Uh, I think that, that, that these kids uh, give me hope. You know, they let me know that that um, the future is in good hands. They yes, they're exciting. very, very you know, exciting. I'm going to stand on what Chadwick Boseman said. We keep saying they're the future. No, they are the now. They yeah. are the now. And I want you yeah. to know that I talked to Charlie and Hannah today, and we are proceeding with their podcast. I just want you to know that and let the audience oh, that is so exciting. Yeah. So we are proceeding. You know, and, uh, yeah. and again, I just have to acknowledge you for seeing all of that brilliance and stepping in and wanting to mentor, like, like uh, Lauren was just talking about Rosenblatt. You know, these kids or every human being need someone to see their brilliance and say yes to it. So you good know, for you. That's one of the reasons I'm coming off the, the television the way I am and going behind the scenes, because one of the things that Fix My Life has taught me is that it has become entertainment. And while many people watch with their notebook and pencil, many get into, look at her hair, no, her, those shoes are not, you know, and what I've discovered in this 21st century, people need an intimate touch. So for me, the be, being able to teach really, you know, for the folk who show up and give them the information, that's what I want to do. That's my passion, because I'm a teacher. That's, that's what I do. Yeah. Yes, you and are. While I teach in the show, I want to be at people to ask me questions and I give them feedback. Yes. And so I learned that in the, in, the, in the pandemic. I learned that doing the antiviral message. So I'm really excited. Yeah. And, 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 your, and your warriors and, and your spiritual warriors program. I'm sure that that. that they are yeah. off the team, yeah. so. Anywho, okay. here we go. So wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, um, let's um, you know, good trouble is good coming trouble. on, oh, right? <laughs> Lauren, <laughs> talked about, Lauren talked about good fear, and I thought that that was such a wonderful phrase that we all should walk away with, to know what good fear is. Yes. But, you know, John Lewis and good trouble, Good Trouble tonight, 9 p.m. on CNN. Tape it, watch it. I love John Lewis. I loved him. I loved him. Yes. I loved him. Yes. So, so what, what did you love most about him? His, he was, first of all, he was a walking demonstration of love. Unbelievable. This man, he just loved. And it's, and it's, it's rare to see a man's man demonstrate so much love. You know, mm -hmm. he wasn't hard with it. He, he was, he, he might have been an alpha male. I don't know, but he, he just loved, he just loved and brilliant. Okay, yeah. with that little yeah. southern drawl and his yeah. little slow walking, and you know, all without the having to prove they, anything, without oh, having oh to my prove God, anything. I love him, but yeah. the thing about, um, Good Trouble is Erica Alexander, you know, uh, she was our guest yes, and yes. she uh, was on Living Single. She's one of the producers. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you know what? I can't even get my eyelashes on CNN. She got a whole show on CNN. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Talk to me. All right. So we've got yes. to, we've got to watch it and support it and let it inspire us. He's, he's going to, 
I just, anyway, let me just shut up. I, I, I just, good trouble. I want to make some Okay, good. so good trouble is tonight. And, uh, you know, you were just talking about um, Erica Alexander. We have had quite a journey over the last, how many months has it been? March, April, May, June, July, seven. August, September. Yes, yeah, seven. Yeah. Seven, seven and some change. And yeah. um, there's been quite a lot that has taken place. Uh, so let's recap it just a little. I mean, we, we, we started off with um, um, Anthony, a Hamilton. Anthony Hamilton. Anthony Hamilton. Then we went to your friend, Susie Orman. Yeah. Right? And uh, in, in the interim, we have had, uh, we, we should have counted it. I don't know how many guests we've had, but well, we've had, we had, had, had uh, Tina Knowles, Mama Beyonce. We had Devon, yeah. Teddy Riley, Melanie Fiona. We've had, yes. uh, um, uh, we had Susie. Yep. We had, oh my God, uh, KJ Rose. Um, we had, um, let us see, let us see. We had, Ty Tribbett and his wife. We had Sally Whitfield and D D D Andre. And Andre, uh-huh. Gina Belafonte. Come on, somebody. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes. So, uh, Wendy Barry and, and Eugenia taught us about how to take care of the madam. That was quite interesting. <laughs> Uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am just, uh, I'm just hearing from our producers and Lauren Simmons is still in the house Okay. and her mom is now with her. So let's invite them back in to say hello. Come on in. Come on, mama. <laughs> Hi, mama. Yeah. Hi, mama. Hi, mama. Hi. Hi. What a beautiful family. I'm taking a yeah. picture of that family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You did a good thank job. You, you did a good job. Lauren is wonderful. Thank you for yeah. coming back in. <laughs> we can't forget that we had her. We had Rhapsody. I mean, so I'm so proud of myself that every guest that we've had, I knew something about them. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm so I am so happy that you did because yes. you know I'm I'm really not a um I, I live under a rock and so I did a lot of for the last seven months I actually had the honor of learning a lot you know yeah. uh, learning about people learning about uh, some issues yeah, that I didn't know about okay. uh, it was really wonderful to meet all of these brilliant, committed uh, to excellent people. And to just know again, that regardless of the chaos that we're seeing out there, there's a lot of power, a lot of good minds, a lot of good souls with a vision that is meant to serve us all or take us to a higher level. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of this planet right now, Iyanla, yeah. because it's needed, yeah. you know? So it's important that um, we tell our guests, remind our guests that this is our last live broadcast. Yeah, I was about to go to that right <laughs> now. So let me just say to our love and best ambassadors, um, as we mentioned last week, today is our last live virtual audience show. Uh, this has been a year like no other. Each and every moment has been special, and we are so thankful that you joined us on this journey. But don't worry, there is plenty more to come. We will be releasing a previously recorded episode every week on our Love From A Distance YouTube channel and on Iyanla's Facebook and YouTube channels. So hop over and make sure that you subscribe to both. Uh, subscribe to uh, YouTube.com uh, slash Iyanla Vanzant and YouTube. I don't know no. what I am. <laughs> okay. And YouTube.com slash, uh, slash love from a distance. And also be sure to look out for announcements on the future of love from a distance by subscribing to our love letter at uh, lovefromadistance.live. 
Yanla. Yes, um, can I say yes. a joy and an honor it has been. Remember, we started this just to get people through the pandemic. And so yes. now that the world is opening up, I know you're yes. going back to work. I'm already back yes. to work. But yes. if, you know, I'm going to, I came on here to work with Aunt Vi. And, and I ended <laughs> up meeting and joining and falling in love with Miss Tina. So it has yeah. been a true blessing. I don't know where our roads will cross again, but I'm sure they will. And I yeah. say to you, deep bow, my beloved. Oh, friend. I feel the same about you, Iyanla. And I thank you so much for the brilliance, the tireless brilliance, the amount of love that you have poured into this country and poured into our community specifically, you are doing work at a level that will be the norm in years to come. Yeah. And you were here laying the groundwork. And I feel so excited for all of the people who are listening, not just our platform, but who will be able to engage with you as a teacher in the ways that you envision going forward. So you let me know how I can support you. You let us know how we can get that word out because I know people who want to learn what yeah, you yeah. have so passionately mm -hmm. um, talked about and are so masterfully good at teaching. Well, since I'm a teacher, I'm sending all our listeners away with an assignment. Here is your home assignment, Psalm 37 and Psalm 91 every day for the next 30 days so that we can turn some energy around. Like Ms. Lauren said, focus the energy of our mind so that we can... Uh, we can create some waves. You know, I love wade in the water. Mm -hmm. The water is being troubled right now. So we want to get on the boat and make sure that we get to shore safely. <laughs> love you, Miss Tina. Love you too, Sister Curls. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you.